So let's go over splinting. Splinting is supposed to immobilize <coughs> sprains, strains, fractures, and dislocations because we're unable to identify whether or not there's an actual break or fracture in the continuity of whatever extremity or bone that we're looking at in the pre-hospital setting. Now it requires to have some kind of x-rays in order to determine such. And with those four types of injuries, sprains, strains, dislocations, and fractures, they cause a lot of pain, inflammation, and a lot of deformities or swelling to that particular area or extremity. So we'd be using a splint. Now there are many different types of splint. There are cardboard splints, commercialized splint. This is a SAM splint. It's very moldable. We can unroll this. This can conform to many different shapes and sizes. We can even use large padded devices such as a blanket. In this case, I'm just using a large uh, trauma dressing that can be used as a type of splint, a soft padded splint. And then we would need to have our, our roller bandage here to uh, <clears throat> secure it down. In other cases, we may also be using something like this. So long bone immobilization, we'd be using some kind of cardboard splint, a manufactured splint, or in this case, traction splint. Um, if we're unable to find anything such, uh, if we're by ourselves without any equipment, then we can think about buddy splinting or anatomically splinting. Buddy splinting is like splinting your fingers together. The injured finger is splinted to the good fingers and this keeps it all in line. In this case, for a pediatric patient, if the, there was an injury somewhere along the, the thigh or the lower extremity, we can splint the good leg to the bad leg. But in order to do so, we would have to pad the voided spaces so between the legs and in the groin, and then we'd go ahead and secure this. <clears throat> now, as far as uh, splinting goes, you're gonna take your splint and you're gonna measure on the unaffected side to measure it out so that you want to immobilize the joints above and below the fractured site or injured site. So example, if this is somewhere down here at the ankle area, we want to go ahead and secure the, the foot, the ankle, and potentially up to the knee here would have to be all covered by our splint so that it's covering the joints above and below the fractured site or injured site and keeping it immobilized. So while you have your partner or you go and address measuring out the splint, the other partner needs to check the distal parameters of the affected injury. So that means checking the pulse. This would be the solus pedis, posterior tibialis. You wanna check these pulses, capillary refill. You wanna check the skin color, temperature, as well as the sensation. Can they feel this? Can they feel this? Does it feel the same? And whether or not there's any movement. So pulse motor and sensory, but taking a look as far as color, temperature, and, and swelling along, along the lines of, of evaluating the extremity. Once the extremity is evaluated for the PMS or distal parameters or your uh, circulation motor and sensory, somebody needs to stabilize and make sure that this leg doesn't move anymore. So another provider would uh, immobilize that, that extremity, maybe the arm or leg, while you measure out on the unaffected side, side of the splint, so this would fit perfectly, we would cover the ankle and the foot, as well as immobilizing the joint above that, which would be the knee. We would want to pre-roll these. These dressing, these, these uh, cardboard splints are made so that we can sort of mold the top areas <clears throat> so that it will conform around the extremity when we wrap this together. We may also want to use extra padding in there and bundle it up so when we do place this underneath the leg, it forms more of a secured uh, feel to it, and it takes away all those voided uh, spaces. So we're gonna have our second rescuer to help us gently elevate that as we slide our splint underneath. <clears throat> we're gonna manage this and wrap this all together using this elevation here. We're gonna wrap this up, and we wanna make sure that we secure above and below the fracture sites, and the joints above and below the fracture sites by keeping exposed our area to check the distal parameters. So we wanna leave the nucellus pedis or posterior tibialis so that we can evaluate the pulses once we're done. Now, once this is secured in place and we check the distal parameters for a second time, noting that nothing has changed and we didn't cause any type of iatrogenic cause that may have affected the pulse motor sensory, we wanna use something called rice therapy. This is rice therapy again. It's rest, ice compression, and elevation. So what we would do is put an ice pad 
or ice pack right over that area when we are trying to secure this all together so that the ice is directly there over that injured site. What ice does is it goes in and decreases the circulation to that area by decreasing blood flow. As a result, there's not a lot of swelling going on and not a lot of pressure there. It also aids by numbing the nerve endings. So we have a few effects. It's decreasing swelling and it's aiding with uh, numbing that area. So some local analgesic effects by using ice compression. Elevation allows that blood circulation to, uh, to be decreased to that area as we don't want this site to continue to become uh, edematous and swollen. Again, we're gonna monitor this distal parameters, pulse motor sensory, circulation, motor and sensory, pulse, motor, sensory, color, temperature, <clears throat> throughout the, the transport of our patient. Again, there are many different types of splinting devices. Cardboard splint, improvised splint, buddy splints, there's this type of soft malleable type commercialized splint and then for another, other types of long bone, more age specific, this is for the adult when we do have pediatric size uh, traction splint for a long bone immobilization.